All right. Okay, this is my third uh, talk in this uh, Adobe Theater. So my first talk was on uh, the dramatic portrait. And then yesterday I talked about the creative revolution, being an artist. You're unique, one of a kind. There's no one on the planet just like you. You're special. That's good news. Um, today I'm going to talk about how we can survive in the marketplace and make a living with our passion. Wouldn't that be great? Well, I've been doing this a long time, and I started out, I was terrible at marketing. I didn't have a clue. And I was so shy, I couldn't uh, exert myself. I was nervous. Um, I had to work through all that. Now, you see me up here on stage, you say, he looks pretty, no, he doesn't look very nervous. But when I started out, I was pretty nervous. Uh, and now I get up in front of people, it's a lot easier. But I had to work through that. And so I made a lot of mistakes. And so one of the things I've learned is that you can be the greatest photographer on the planet and you can never really make any money. And so maybe you're there. I always say there's a lot of photographers that could do better at taking pictures than I can. But one of the things I've learned is how to market. So I want to teach that. I want to pass it on to you because I want you to reach your goals and your dreams. And I want you to make a living at photography. It's possible. Now, not everyone in here is going to get it. Uh, and that's the way life is. But some of you will. Some of you will take this on and you'll go and do great things with, um, with uh, your marketing. So I hope that's true. So I always say I'm here for at least one person. One person has to get it. Then it's worth it for me. So I want you to get it. Um, so I was so shy, but I ended up getting a uh, studio right out of college with a guy who was really good at marketing. I was terrible. He was good. And so I learned a lot from him. He was sort of like um, just naturally gifted at going out and getting work. And he was not shy. And uh, I was. So I learned a lot from him. In fact, it was kind of brutal, some of the things I had to go through to learn from him. All right, so let's talk about the truth about marketing. Now, I don't have a PhD in, uh, well, I don't know if there's a PhD in marketing, but I, have, I did uh, give a lecture once, and there was a guy in the audience who was a professor at a university who taught marketing. And I said, give me the thumbs up or the thumbs down after the end of the show. And he had two thumbs up. So I think I'm on track here. Um, the first thing is that uh, becoming a marketing genius has nothing to do with being brilliant. If it did, I wouldn't qualify. I was barely a C student. And so you say, you know what, I'm not very smart or I'm not, you know, as like a, you know, I'm not a genius. You don't have to be. You don't have to, in fact, you don't have to have a degree in marketing to uh, succeed in the marketplace. That's number one. Um, so there is one thing, I touched on it yesterday, but there is one thing that keeps us all from moving forward in marketing. One thing, it hinges on it all. And that goes back to the fact that we all hate to be rejected. Uh, and it's uh, just like torture. I would rather take a saw and cut off my left foot than have to make a cold call and market. Do you, you feel like that? I just hate it. I hate marketing, or I hated it. And so I was afraid to be rejected. So I had to overcome that. But one of the things that I had discovered is that um, in life, this I had this slide on there yesterday, is that we are all weak, fragile, and secure. You may be, this guy looks pretty tough right here. He's a tough guy, but you know what? He's still weak, fragile, and secure, just like I am. When it comes to my exerting myself and putting myself out there, I hate that rejection. And so uh, I don't know how tough you are. Um, we all suffer from it to some degree or another. And the problem is, is that I don't care if you spent uh, a lot of money to get a degree in photography uh, or master's in photography. Uh, when you hit the real world, it's 100% guarantee you're going to be rejected. There's no way to avoid it. You may come from uh, royalty <laughs> or you may have uh, a very wealthy uh, uh, father, uh, but when you hit the real world and pound on the streets, you're going to be rejected. 
So whether you want to be an actor or a musician or you, whatever it is in life that you want to go after, if you hit the real world, you're going to be rejected. And so, you know, in Hollywood, there's actors that go, and they, you, all the stories that you read about these actors that you think are amazing, but they all had to go through it. They had to get, go to these uh, rehearsals or what do you call them, the, the casting, and they get rejected after rejected. And I do a lot of casting now for uh, c- commercial shoots, and sometimes I do a kid shoot, right, you know, where I have there's kids involved, and they all come in with their little portfolios with their moms. And I've had over 100 kids come through my, port- or my studio just for one, one slot. So 99 kids had to be rejected. That hurts. And so you can't avoid it. So the first thing that you're going to have to learn to succeed in the marketplace is you're going to have to learn how to pick up your phone and make a cold call. A cold call is you have to maybe have just a name and you have to exert yourself and, and say, hello. My name is Joel Grimes. I'm a photographer. I'd like to come in and show my portfolio. There's some, you have to overcome this little thing right here. So the first time that I started making cold calls, I had this friend who was very good at marketing. He said, we got to make cold calls. I didn't know what that was at the time. And he's, we, back in those days, we didn't have a cell phone. We had a phone with a cord that went into the wall. Remember those days? And so we had, we were so broke, we didn't have any money. And we had an old door with two sawhorses, and that's our table. We had the phone in the middle, and we had a, a book from the library that had the top 500 corporations in Colorado. We were in Denver, Colorado. And so he started off, and he'd start out just as smooth as silk. He was so good. Steve Sammons here. And it was my turn. And this is how I sounded. I was so bad, you couldn't even understand my name. And I, one time I, I, I said, I'm a photographer, and the lady said, you're a photocopier? I mean, it was bad. So Steve's standing over me, listening to me. So, you, you know, it's hard enough to make a cold call when you're by yourself, but when someone's standing over you, critiquing you, it's brutal. And he's saying, okay, Joel, you're... you're Relax. You're 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 nervous. I know. Um, you're apologetic. I say, you know, I, I hate to bother you. I'd love to come and show my portfolio sometime when you're not busy. You know, maybe in five years from now. You know, I was just so apologetic. So I had to learn to pick up the phone. And so the first year that I was in business, officially in business. I logged in over three thousand cold calls. I had a little three before computers. Back with the horse and buggy, remember those days? But I had three by five cards, and I would make my little notes, and I'd put them in a little slot, and I made over 3,000 cold calls my first year in business, and it launched my career. So I speak at a lot of different uh, photography programs, colleges, and universities now. And if I was in charge of a, the curriculum for a photo program, I would have cold calling 101 as part of the curriculum. Because if you don't learn to pick this phone up and call someone you don't know, you'll never survive. And today, I get a tip. Someone, a, one of my art director friends says, hey, my friend over at Shy at Day, he's doing the Gatorade account, and he's looking for a photographer. Here's his phone number. Yes. But I still got a call. And I look at that phone, even today, I look at that phone, And my heart starts to beat a little bit extra fast, right? But I know that my kids have to eat. I have to pay for my mortgage, my car payment, and my haircuts. No, those are free. Um, And I have to make that cold cold call. I have to. It's the only way I'm going to succeed is making a cold call. So you've got to learn that. It's not easy. So let's go through some stats here. If you can get these next couple couple slides, you're going to become a rock star in the photo industry. Ready? Studies have shown that only 5% of creatives, that's you, you're a creative person, you're with a camera, you're kind of artsy, you're creative, and you hate to market. So only 5% of creatives market effectively. Now remember this, remember this percentage, right? So that's you. So 95% of us on the planet are lousy at marketing. So let's go to the next slide. Studies have shown that most people fail to make more, uh, when they go to solicit 
an art director, creative director, a uh, photo editor or whatever, that they don't make more than two attempts with that person. After two attempts, they quit. That's the net average. If you ever do make an attempt, it's no more than two. That's our human nature. So if I call an art director and they say, well, I'm really busy this week. Uh, and I say, well, can I call you later? Yeah. So I call them again. They go, I'm really busy this week. You usually after two, you give up. Right? That's human nature. Now, hang on. So the, the, the odds of securing a sale after two attempts is less than 10%. Not very good. So let's increase the odds. How do we do that? So I want you to, do you have a hat? Hang on to it. This is it. This is a secret. This is the secret to success right here. The odds of securing a sale after eight attempts goes up to 80%. Wow, 80%. That's a pretty good odds. Why is that? I call it the power of eight. Here's the reason why. You're a human being, I hope, unless you're an alien from another planet. And you're pitching a human being. Right? So number one, you're a little nervous, you're apprehensive, you're afraid you're going to be, uh, you know, um, annoying, you're bugging them, imposing upon them. And the person that you are uh, uh, um, pitching or whatever, trying to get to go and show your portfolio or get hired, is a human being. They have a boss, probably. They have uh, budgets. They have assignments, deadlines. They have maybe kids at home. One of them's teething and keeping them up at night. Maybe they went through a divorce. You don't know. They're a human being. They got all this stuff that's going on in their life. You pitch them, and they go, I don't have time for you. They don't give you much time, right? You get a rejection. Um, but then you stick with it. You call them again. I'm going to show you how to do this. I, I send a promo packet out, I call. Send a promo packet out, I call. And my goal is to get to eight. And the reason why eight is important is that our brains don't have a very good memory. So if a lot of photographers are calling an art director, art buyer, a photo editor, and you say, I'm Billy Bob Jones, and then you, you, know, you hang up, they're not going to remember who you are. But if you get your name in front of that little brain, those little gray cells, at least eight times, they will start to remember who you are. And... Here's the problem. Every art director, every photo editor, every art buyer is just like me and you in that one day they're going to panic. Their number one photographer's busy. Their number two photographer's on vacation. Their number three photographer happened to be uh, wife's having a baby. Their number four photographer got hit by a semi-truck on the last job. Um, so they're going to come down and they're going to go, panic, I need a photographer. Joel Grimes, because I've called them at, and made at least eight attempts to them. And so this is how the real world works. It's not how good you are. It's how many times, you hopefully you're a good photographer, but it's how many times you get your name in front of them that they remember who you are. This is how it works, folks. And so do the math. I'm terrible at math, but do the math. Eight is a magic number. I have proven this so many times. So I've moved around a little bit. I did a book project on the Navajo Indians in Arizona, and I was in Denver. I started marketing Denver, and then I left, and I did this book project, and I finally came back after five years. My wife and I are from, were, uh, that's where I met my wife. And so we were back in Denver, and I had to start all over. And so I got my computer. I had a little computer by then, and I started to work on my name. So I started doing my research, and I'm, you got to do your research to find out who the art buyer is, who the art director is, who it is that looks at photographers' portfolios. And I started doing my phone calls, getting all the names. And then I put them in my computer, and I had 50 names. Only 50, not 500, 50. A manageable number of names. And I started to send a packet Follow up with a phone call. Send a packet. I get my power eight. Within two years, I worked for 48 of those companies or art directors or art buyers. It took me two more years to get the last two. I was so determined to make sure I had 100% return on my list. That's magic. That's unbelievable. 
That's the way it works. Because I kept putting my name in front of them. And one day, they're in a panic. They need a photographer. And Joel Grimes pops in their little gray cells. All right? So let's talk about overcoming rejection. Um, this is, again, based on yesterday I talked about our, our humanity. Our humanity gets in our way all the time. All right, so in America, we have country music. Well, you know that kind of music, right? Probably don't listen to it here, right, in the Netherlands. But anyways, my wife likes country music. Um, you like rap, right? Okay. But there's a diversity between country music and rap. Huge gap between the styles, right? So what are the odds that someone that really likes rap is into country music? Probably not. So if you have a, let's say you're a musician, you have your little demo, and you're going to go knock on doors to get a, a record deal, and you're down at uh, eight, uh, Music Row in L.A., Sony uh, Records and Columbia Records and whatever, and you walk into um, a rap label, and there's a guy with a gold tooth going, yo, dude, and you have your little country uh, demo, and you say, I would love to have a record deal. And he says, all right, let me check and see what you got. Puts it in. Dun, 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 tick, ding, tick. Well, how long do you think he'll listen to that? <laughs> Not very long, right? <laughs> Out the back door you go. And you hit the pavement. <laughs> I've been rejected, right? And that happens with us in photography. I end up taking my food portfolio into an agency that only does people. And they throw me out the back door. And I get crushed thinking that they don't like me. Well, the real world is you got to understand that there's people that have certain needs and there's certain likes and dislikes. And you walk in the door and they just may not like what you have or you may not fit what they have. So don't take it personally. And we do that because we're human. We come undone very quick. So my very first portfolio showing, I think I talked to you guys uh, yesterday about this, is I was so excited. My uh, friend Steve got me my portfolio, and I was following his lead, and he said, here's what you got to do. Here's the case. We had my uh, Joel Grimes embossed on this outside of each little photograph. I was so excited. I made an appointment with a creative director at Fox Sweeney and True at, at agency in Denver. I was like a little nervous. I walked in, sat down at the conference room. He opened my portfolio up. And I had just moved from Tucson, Arizona, a small town. And now I'm in big city Denver. And he said, I said, I just graduated from college, moved from Tucson. And he said, oh, yeah, okay. He looks at my portfolio. It was a transparency backing. He looked, hmm. He said, you know how many photographers have a, a business license in photography in Denver? I said, no. He said, over 2,000. Really? Now, that didn't make me feel very good. Because that's a lot. And he goes, I got some advice for you, young man. I said, what's that? He goes, go back to Tucson. <laughs> Knife right in my chest. And I walked out. I could bench over 300 pounds, but when I hit that pavement, I had tears in my eyes and a lump in my throat. And I went back to my studio. Where my friend Steve was waiting for me. And I came through the door. I think he saw the look on my face. He said, how'd it go? And I said, Steve, didn't go well. I said, I can't do this. My dad was a fireman. My brother, two of my brothers are firemen. And my dad wanted me to be a fireman. And I said to Steve, I said, I'm going back to Tucson. I guess I'm going to end up being a, a fireman. And he said something to me right in my face. He got right up to me and he said, you're going to let one person steal your dream? And I said, yes. He goes, you're going to let one person steal your dream? And I said, I know it sounds crazy. He goes, 10 years from now, you say, you know, I got a degree in photography, and I, had a, I wanted to be a photographer, but one person stole my dream. <laughs> sounds kind of silly, doesn't it? But that's what was going on. He said, don't let one person steal your dream. Luckily, I, my friend Steve was there to rescue me. Hopefully, you have a friend like that. But he, he said, stick with it. I did. The story doesn't end there. A year later, he said, you need to go back to Fox, Sweeney, and True, the ad agency. And I said, yes, with a brick and a note on that brick. <laughs> Whing, through the window. 
Every time I'd drive by that agency, my heart would start to pound a little bit, right? And I'd start to sweat, you know, because it brought back all that memory. He said, go back to Fox, Winnie, and True. And I went back. This time I talked to an art director, and I was photographing. I came through college only photographing landscapes, no people portraits. And so I was doing architecture. I was doing, like, golf brochures and no people. And I walked in that agency. We went down, this time down to the art room, and I was looking around for, for Franz Cannell. And the lady started looking at my work, and she said, wow, I love your interiors. Do you think you could put a mom, a dad, two kids on a couch inside of a big uh, living room in a, in a house? Like a lifestyle shoot. And I said, sure. The agency that almost stole my dream launched my people career. I ended up doing 15 ad campaigns. The first one that came out was full page in the Rocky Mountain News. Do you know how many newspapers I bought that Sunday? Like 30 of them. Isn't that incredible? I stuck with it. And luckily, I had a friend there to help me. Um, so don't make it, don't take it personally when someone tells you you, you suck. Um, it could be that you're knocking on the wrong door. It could be that someone's testing you. Do you ever test anybody? Yeah, we test people all the time. People want to know if you're serious. They want to know if you really want to chase your dream. And so I win people over with my enthusiasm, with my dedication to the craft. I'm there. Yes. I'm, I can do it for you. Yes, give me a chance. And so um, I, I want to win somebody over. All right, so persistence. Persistence will win over more people than a great portfolio. Wait a minute. I thought if you were a really good photographer, you would get a lot of work. No. I'm going to ask you a question. Let's just take Amsterdam as a, an example. And you're a photographer. And every day, let's say every work day, Amsterdam, around the whole metropolitan area, they are hiring photographers. Let's say wedding uh, to editorial to uh, graphic design uh, packaging or whatever, ad agencies, whatever. So every day, let's just say a hundred people out of all the people that are, th uh, that are out there, a hundred people are hiring a photographer. That's not unrealistic. Unreal out of all the hundred jobs that are being awarded every day, how many do you have the skill set right now to accomplish? You could probably do at least 80% of the jobs. Maybe 20% are over your head. They want a picture of the CEO. You can handle that, right? There's, I mean, most of, the, most of the stuff out there is not rocket science. If it was, I couldn't do it. You, could, you have the skill set right now. But why aren't you getting all the work? Because you haven't put your name in front of the right person. That's it. That's how simple it is. You think that you have to be a really good photographer to get work. And I hope you are increasing your skill set as a photographer. If you looked at my stuff back when I was starting, you'd go, this guy has no chance. But over time, my skill set increased, my ability to market increased. And so um, I learned the power of persistence. Now, don't have a lousy portfolio, but the power of persistence and learning how to take it and making a cold call and calling up somebody and realizing the person on the other end of that phone could have a bad day. Now, I didn't tell you the last part of that story with Franz Cannell at Fox Weenie through my very first portfolio showing and my very first rejection. So at the first photo shoot, I'm setting my camera up. Back then we had film cameras and we had a Polaroid back on a medium format camera. And just as I pull out my medium format or my Polaroid back part to put on, Franz Cannell walks into the set. And I start shaking. I am not kidding you. I couldn't even get that Polaroid back on the back of that camera. I'm like, he's shaking, you know, and he's coming over. And I'm like, oh, my God, here he comes. And he comes over and he goes, hi, I'm Fran. And I'm like, uh-huh. I go, he goes, have we met before? I said, not that I can remember. And he eventually and I became good friends because he was at all the shoots and, you know, I got to know him pretty well. And I spent maybe 10 years working for that ad agency. And then I moved to, uh, back to Tucson. My wife and I spent nine years in Tucson before we moved to L.A. But um, I went back to Denver. So now 
18, no, maybe 17 years had gone by since I had showed my first portfolio to Franz Cannell. And I was visiting all my friends at the photo labs. Do you know what that is, a photo lab? They're kind of obsolete now. But I was standing at the counter talking to uh, one of my friends. Franz Cannell walks in the door. I hadn't seen him in a couple years. And he says, Joel, how are you doing? I go, great. He goes, I keep hearing you're shooting ad campaigns for Volvo and Visa and Red Bull and all this stuff. You have an amazing career. And I said, I got a story for you, Fran. I said, do you know you were the very first portfolio showing I ever did in Denver? And he goes, I was? I said, yeah. And I said, I showed you four boards and you told me to get out of town. He goes, I did? I said, yeah. And I said, it was brutal. And I said, it was so difficult that I almost quit photography. And he goes, are you kidding me? And I said, he goes, I didn't know that. And I said, yeah. But I said, you know what? The best thing that ever happened to Joel Grimes back in 1984 when I showed my portfolio to you for the first time was that you brutally rejected me. He goes, that was a good thing? I go, yeah. I go, you know why it was? Because I had to make a decision right there. Was I willing to get rejected on a daily basis to chase my dream? You have to do that. You have to go through a brutal rejection to test yourself whether or not you're willing to move forward and say, yeah, I'm willing to be rejected to chase my dream. So get it over with. Get that brutal rejection over with. Because once you get it over with, every rejection after that is not as bad. I got brutal rejection. One time I had a guy, I had my boards. I walked in, he's an art director. I pulled my board out, you know, my boards, and I said, oh, you know, hi. He was kind of sitting there, not very friendly. He put my, his boards on, my boards on his lap, and he went like this. An eighth inch between each board. He didn't even look at him. He went like this. Handed it back to me. I mean, what do you do to that? What do you say? <laughs> Knock the guy out? No. You just go, okay, I'm going to go on to the next one. So I have had 20 rejections in a row without one person even saying, hey, you're a good photographer. But you keep going on. Because then all of a sudden, bam, the door opens. It, and all of a sudden, I've done this. I've walked in, show my portfolio after lots of rejections. And they go, Wow, hold on a second. They bring the creative director in. Creative director brings the owner of the ad agency in, whatever. They're all standing around going, wow, this is great stuff. When are you available? And I'm like going, where's the candid cameras? <laughs> this can't be true. And so, uh, but I keep going on. I just keep plugging away and good things happen. All right, here's another one. I have a, a mindset that one day I will... Um, have the opportunity to prove my worth and save a client from a crisis. So just remember this, folks. The person that you're pitching is a human being. They got problems, deadlines, all these things. And you're sitting there at the sideline waiting for that crack in the door when you can save them from a crisis. And so when someone tells you, oh, we have five photographers we use on a regular basis. We're good to go. And I used to go and cross them off my list. And one day I got to thinking, you know what? Is that true? No, it's not true. You know why? Because one day they might need a sixth. So I thought about that. And so every time a art director would say, we're covered. We're good. No worries. Don't call me back. We're good. We've got five photographers we use on a regular basis. We're covered. And I always say, is it possible one day you might need a sixth? silence. They're thinking about that. And they go, that is possible. And I go, guess what? I'm your number sixth. And almost everyone I've ever said that to, they end up hiring me. And then I become their number one photographer. All right, getting your foot in the door. Let's talk about the practical uh, things about getting your foot in the door. Um, I like practical. All right, I always throw a few images in here so it kind of breaks things up. Decide what market you want to target. Do you like babies? If you like babies, great. If you don't like babies, don't photograph babies. You'll end up in jail. You know? <laughs> you know? Do you like animals, dogs, cats? Do you like horses? Do you like, what do you like? Okay? Decide what you like. 
If you don't like photographing weddings, do not photograph weddings. But if you like weddings, great. So decide what market. So here we go. We've got consumer direct. That means the person next door to you could be a, a, a potential customer. You know, you meet people all the time that need photographs, weddings or uh, family portraits or whatever. And so there's an opportunity to create a living right there. Beautiful. Editorial, trade magazines, consumer magazines. Uh, not a lot of money in, uh, in editorial, but there's a great opportunity to build your portfolio. And when you become the top of the top, you can maybe get paid a decent wage for an editorial shoot. But really, not a lot of money in editorial. But it's a great arena. Corporate direct. Take a stone, go down to uh, Amsterdam, throw it, and you'll probably hit a building that needs photography. Everybody needs headshots. People get promoted. People build products. They need stuff done. They have annual reports. They have uh, brochures. And so Corporate Direct is a great place to go. And I don't know about what you call it in Amsterdam or here in the Netherlands, but um, graphic design agencies are smaller ad agencies. A lot of them do packaging. They do like, like, um, you know, like a CD c uh, cover would be a design, a design uh, situation, not an ad situation, but a lot of design, posters and things. So I, I did a lot of work for design firms early on. And then at some point, you can maybe go after the ad agencies. That's the big nut. That's the big dollars. But here's the thing. I want to give you a little secret. It doesn't take any more work to become a successful wedding photographer as it does a successful ad agency photographer or a Pulitzer winning prize photographer. It all takes work. It takes focus and dedication toward that one thing. I got lucky because I had a studio mate who said, let's go after ad, ad agencies. I didn't know what they were. I didn't know what an art director was or a creative director or an art buyer. Had, those terms meant nothing to me. But with time, I learned. And with time, I started to get into the ad agencies. But um, you got to start somewhere. But really, pick, your, pick what you want and then go after it. And... Um, the first thing you got to do is get a list of names. So now the Internet's around, so we can go, you know, look up under, let's just take, let's, for example, let's take hospitals. Now, in the States, in the United States, we, uh, the, most hospitals have a marketing department, and they want customers, right? And so, um, so you call up the hospital. You just have a phone number. You look it up in the phone book or on the Internet, and you get a phone number, and it's a receptionist. And you say, hi, my name is Joel Grimes. I'm a photographer. I specialize in medical photography, and I would like to talk, or I'd like the name of the person that handles hiring photographers. And they say, well, that's the marketing person, and that's Betty Smith. Thank you very much. You don't want to talk to Betty Smith right away because you haven't sent her anything yet. So you get Betty Smith's name and you put it in your little list and you're like this. Ching, ching. That's a start. That's where it all starts on getting the right name. Once you get that name, folks, it's money in the bank. Then what you do is, oh, by the way, titles come in all flavors, right? So don't just say, I want the marketing director because it could be the communications director or they have some other title for it. Right? So don't be stuck on titles. Ask who handles looking at photographers' portfolios. Then you create a series of little promos. You could have a lab do it for you or a printing uh, outfit do it for you. You can build them yourself. I usually build them myself. And then I have this little delicate little book, maybe a spiral bound on it or some little handmade book. And I don't have to, I don't have to make that many of them, right? If I have 50 names, I'm gonna, I want to do four different books. Four different promos, all look the same. I call them Portfolio 1, Portfolio 2, or whatever. And I get that first book, I put a nice little envelope, and I put it in the mail. And I send it out the door. And this, on this bottom section here is an old one that I had. This, I, I had this slide for some reason, but this is, I did little cards once. I had Joel Grimes Photography on it. So it's a little promo book. All right, so you get that put in the mail. And then you got to time it so that when it hits their desk, you call within a day or two. You don't go and send it and then call three weeks later because they've, by then they put it in the trash can or something, right? So you, it hits their desk. So you don't want to send out too many. I would always send out 10, maybe 10, and then I'd do my follow-up. And I'd call up, and I would uh, almost always get voicemail, right? Typically, you don't get them on the phone. No problem because what you're going to do is this. Hi, Joel Grimes here. I just sent you a little packet 
a little promo piece that has some of my portraits in it. I would love to meet you in person and find out what your needs are in photographer. And again, it's Joel Grimes. Here's my phone number. So now I've put their, she opened it up, saw Joel Grimes. I left a message and she heard Joel Grimes again. Ching, ching, that's two. And then I go back and I do it four times, four more promos, and I get my total of eight. My goal is to get, get, oh, by the way, always leave a message. You ever, you ever get someone's voicemail and you go, oh, a little nervous, and you hang up, right? Or you push the button and turn it off? That's because we're, you're human. Always leave a voicemail. All right, so um, you want to do it eight times, but here's a little problem that we have because I'm human, is I don't want to call Monday morning because people just got off the weekend, right? They're a little grumpy. And so then I think, you don't call Friday afternoon because the people are going to the weekend, right? They're thinking about the weekend. And so then you go, well, I don't call too close to lunch because the people are thinking about lunch. And you don't call too close after lunch because people are thinking about, you know, well, I just had a big meal. And then you don't call too late at the end of the day because they're getting ready to go home, right? So one day I wrote on a piece of paper, when's the, op oh, wait, that's not even the end of it. You know, this is no joke because I'm human. When it's a real cloudy, muggy, cold day, I'm thinking, bad time to call because everyone's in a bad mood, right? And so then when it's sunny out, I go, bad time to call because everybody wants to go out and play Frisbee and, and take a walk. So I psych myself out. And at one time I wrote down, when's the optimal time to call? When the receptionist answers the phone. That's the optimal time to call. Don't make an excuse. You'll psych yourself out because you're human. So you call. When the, they're in business hours, you call. I called one time at like 10 minutes till the end of the Friday on a Friday uh, work day, and I got landed the biggest job I ever got in my life. The art director said, oh, my gosh, I forgot to get a photographer for Monday. And it's Friday afternoon. I saved his day. And I ended up working for that guy for years. Big ad agency. So you got to make the phone calls, and you got to keep pressing away. So get to your eight. Power of eight. It's a magical number. It's crazy. It's like magic. It really works. Trust me. I wouldn't be standing in front of you today if it didn't work. All right, let's keep going. I know we got a clock and I got a time limit. I love doing this. This is my favorite talk, by the way. Um, and I love talking about how to take pictures, too. But the truth about marketing or your competition, let's go through. Remember, Franz Canel told me there are over 2,000 photographers in the uh, Denver area with a business license in photography. Whoops, I went too fast there. Well, anyways, so I wrote down that 2,000 on a piece of paper. Now, I'm not a very bright person, but I, you know, kind of started doing the math a little bit. So I said, but, you know, is it really 2,000? I was doing architecture at the time, so I thought, out of the 2,000, how many do architecture? How many have the big 4 by 5 and they can do the big, you know, architecture? I thought, well, maybe 500 out of the 2,000. And this, this is just, this math is just a generalization. So I thought, okay, you know what? I was living in a warehouse with no heat in the middle of winter in Denver, and I was on, I was on a foam pad in a sleeping bag. I had no kitchen. There was no shower. Uh, I was roughing it, folks. I was chasing my dream. And you know when there's no heat, and you're, and you're in your sleeping bag, and you go, and the morning light comes and sees all the, your breath. You're like, I'm not getting out of my sleeping bag. But at 2,000, I couldn't get out. At 500, I thought, you know what? I'd unzip it. You know, it's like, okay, maybe I'll get out. Now, I thought, wait a minute. We all have different styles, and there's edgy, soft, you know, whatever. I said, you know, out of all the 500 photographers that could do architecture, how many do the bold kind of approach that I did at the time. I was kind of a bold architectural photographer. I said, okay, let's say half of them could do that. All right. So I thought, wait, what else separates me from the other 2,000? Well, uh, price. See, now price is an interesting thing because I was starting out and uh, my friend uh, Steve said, um, the average day rate for Denver at that time was $1,500 a day. And so he said, Joel, you're starting out. Why don't you just say, if someone asks you what your day rate is, say 700 Okay, that's the starting. I go, $700 a day? When you're flipping hang hamburgers for $3 an hour, $700 a day seems like a lot. But if you only do one job a year, you can't survive, right? 
But so I started saying I was 700 a day. So that was at the low end of the spectrum. But I thought, how many of all the 250 have a day rate at the low end? I said, well, maybe 100. Well, there's a point to this. Let's go back to my 5%. If only 5% of photographers on the planet are marketing effectively, that means that if I get into the, uh, the point where I'm marketing effectively, then my competition out of the 2,000 or 2, photographers is only 5 and guess what? I, I've, do, I've been doing commercial advertising for over 30 years. And I get called into a boardroom, and they say, we want you to do our annual report, whatever. And I say, who else is bidding on this project? And they say, the same other four photographers. Almost every time I was up against the big jobs, it was this, there's a handful of people that have it all wrapped up. And you know who they are? The ones that are marketing effectively, the ones that are sending out promo packets, the ones that are making phone calls and following up, those are the photographers that are getting called into the boardrooms. There's always five that wrap it up. So in L.A., there's a lot of car shooters. There's only five that have the town wrapped up. You can name all five of them. Boom, boom, boom. These are all the top five photographer car photographers in town. The rest are all begging, whining, like little babies, wishing they had work. Because the, the five that are at the top are the ones that are out marketing. So you want to be successful, get into that 5%. It's not that hard. Learn the power of eight. So don't be over, don't be psyched out by someone that comes up and says, oh, there's over 2,000 photographers in Amsterdam that you're competing against. It's not true. It's not true. And again, um, because I'm human, I give in to that 2,000 very quickly. Don't do that. How am I doing on time? I'm going to keep going. I'm moving hard, fast here. All right. So I have a little statement that says that hard work will outperform talent any day of the week. I had a student in here, Reuben. Where are you at, Reuben? Raise your hand, Reuben. Is he here? He's not here. Well, he just interviewed me, and he said, what's the secret? How do you get to the top? Hard work. Because when I was in college, and there was 40 students in our class, I was the least likely to succeed. I was no rock star in that class. I looked around, I went, wow, look at all these amazing creative people. I don't know if I have a chance. But you know, one little thing, just a little teeny spark, and I remember this as it was yesterday. I thought, you know, if I can outwork them, I might have a chance. And that was at 19 years old. So I've had this hard work ethic ever since. I know that if I put in my time, I'll have success. So, you know, Malcolm Gladwell says that uh, the book on the outlier said that they did studies. And when you get to 10,000 hours, you've mastered anything. So I was in uh, Sweden doing a lecture, a workshop. I had two pilots. They, sh they flew the 747s and the 777s. And I said... Before I had to slide up, I said, how many hours do you think it takes before you have complete command of that airplane and you know it? You know it. And he said, 10 to 12,000 hours of flying. So when you get on the plane, ask your pilot how many hours they've got. If he says 500, don't get on. <laughs> right? But 10,000 hours, you can master anything. I'm going to tell you a little story. I have four boys. And you know, when you raise kids, they're different. And so one kid's good at this, one kid's not, right? And so my oldest boy, he's, he, he would take his little trucks, he'd line them all up perfectly. And everything he did, he would master like that. Came easy to him. My second son, a little clumsy. And he was fumbling through and trying to do things like his brother. And he'd always kind of fall short a little bit. And so... Um, so that, that's Aaron. And so when they got a little bit older, when I was in high school, I rode a unicycle, okay, one wheel. And so my, my, my oldest Ben knew that, and so he said for his birthday he wanted a unicycle. I said, okay, so we bought him a unicycle. And I said, you know what? It's, it seems impossible to ride a unicycle. And you get on that thing and you go, whoop, boom, you just fall, right? And you say, I can't do this. I said, okay, it's going to take about a week before you can go from here to there. And what you do is, you know that you got your pedals this way, right? 
So you fall forward, you pedal forward. You fall back, you pedal back, right? But what if you fall sideways? So you got to turn into your fall. So you learn that. Well, so within three days, he was cruising around. Three days. I'm like, whoa. This kid's like got the gift. So then Aaron went to learn. So Aaron gets on there, blum, 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 and he fumbles and fumbles. About a week, maybe later, even longer than a week, he finally got it. So those two kids started running their unicycles around, and they got on the Internet. And you know Tony Hawk was the skateboarder, right? Well, Chris Holmes is the world's greatest unicycler, and he does things that defy all logic. He can ride on this thing right here or on a round tube or a fence post. He could ride on that. That's how balanced he was. And so my kids would watch these videos. Well, look at Chris Holmes. Look at Chris Holmes. He's amazing. And so one day they come running up with their laptop, and they're going, Chris Holmes is coasting down a mountain road, and the, his feet aren't even on the pedals. He's got his feet up on the post, and the pedals are spinning. He's going 45 miles an hour going, <laughs> and cars are along with the cars. And I look at that, and I go, trick photography. That's not real. No, no, no. He did that, Dad. This is, he does this. He's amazing. I go, it's trick photography. And so we had the announcement we saw that there was every year in Moab, Utah, was the big unicycling gathering. And this year, Chris Holmes was going to be there. So my kids said, Dad, Dad, can we please go to Moab? I said, all right. So we packed the kids up, took off. We went to Moab, and they wanted to meet Chris Holmes. And he was doing all these demonstrations. And he got up on top of a hill in front of a couple thousand people, and he coasted down for us. I saw with my own two eyes the impossible. He's just spinning down that mountain. And everyone's clapping. It's like, okay, he's the only one in the world can do this. And so finally the kids stood in line, and they wanted to meet him and get autographs and stuff. And I said, and so Aaron was about 13 years old, 12, 13 and he had long blonde hair, and he had braces. And, he, and I said, Aaron, what are you going to ask Chris? He's like, I'm going to ask him how to coast down a mountain. I said, well, <clears throat> son, that's a little bit probably over your head. But uh, go ahead and ask him. So we got up there. We waited in line finally, and Aaron says, I want to know how you coast on a unicycle. And Chris said, do you really want to learn? And he's like standing, staring right at him. He goes, with little braces. Yeah? And he said, okay, here's the deal. If you practice two to three hours a day for one, 360 days, you'll get it. Every day. That's two to three hours a day. And, he's, and so he, ta- he said, get two trash cans, and you put your feet up on top so that your foot is touching the, the tire. And you push off, and you get going, and then you rub that tire that put the pressure will slow you down or let, you, let go and speed you up. So you think riding a unicycle is difficult? Coasting on a unicycle is like a thousand times harder. So Aaron and Ben started practicing. A year later, we went to Moab. Two people coasted down that mountain. Who do you think it was? It was Aaron and Chris Holmes because Aaron stuck with it. You can learn anything you want, folks. You want to juggle ten balls? You can learn how to do it. It just takes a time commitment. That's it. And you want to learn how to take pictures? Just invest the time. You want to learn how to market? Just invest the time. It's all about that. You know, I used to watch football every Sunday. Love football, American football. And you know, you can, you can watch football all weekend. There's like enough games you can watch all weekend, right? And so uh, 10 years ago, so I'm, no, it's eight years ago, I'm 58 years old. I know I don't look a day over 70, but um, at 50 years old, I reinvented myself. Okay, some of you say, I'm too old to do this. No, you're not. I'm, I'm too old to reinvent. No, you're not. But in the last eight years, until this last season, I maybe had watched five football games. I gave up football. You know what I did on Sunday afternoons? Taking pictures. Chasing my dream. Putting in the time. I had to make sacrifices. So you're going to have to give up something to reach your goal, to achieve your dream. So it's not easy. That's why I say not everyone in this room is going to get it. Not everyone's going to go, you know what, I'm willing to go and learn how to make cold calls. Or I'm, I'm willing to learn how to go and take portraits out in the cold and the whatever. Do it over and over again. How many hours do you want to put in it? The more hours you put into it, 
um, the, uh, the better you get. So, again, if you spend three hours a day, it'll take you 10 years to master something. Reach your 10,000 hours. So if you put in six hours a day, you can do it in five years. Some people are on the fast track. And I meet people all the time. I look at their work and I go, you've been doing this only three years? Oh, my goodness. And you know, there's people that do what I do better than I do. They take my techniques and do it better than I do. So that's, I could, you could say that's kind of a bummer, but actually it makes me work harder. Because if I want to stay current, i got to keep working hard. So you got to put the time in. And marketing is not easy. Um, so let's do one last slide. I think I've got it. Red light, that means I'm, how much time? We're done. Real quick, and that's this. When it comes time to get hired, remember this. It's not the, I was walking in an ad agency and out the door, they called me in, was the number one photographer in Denver. He passed me and I passed him. He didn't know who I was. I knew who he was. That's Howard Sokol, number one photographer in, in Denver. And I'm thinking, there's no way I can compete with him. I walked into the ad agency, and I sat down at the desk, and they start looking at my work, and I'm thinking, let's get this over with, because Howard Sokol just walked out. And they looked at my work, and they said, how much did you charge for this? And I was just starting out. I said, I'll charge $5,000. They said, congratulations, you got the job. And I went, can I have a question for you? And they said, what? I go, was that Howard Sokol was here for the same job? And they said, Yes. I go, why would you hire me over Howard Sokol? You know what they said? We would love and prefer have to hire Ho Howard over you. But he was too expensive. So the beauty is you can compete in the marketplace because Howard Sokol had a big studio with a staff and he couldn't charge what I charge. I can make a profit of 5000 He couldn't. He had to charge 10000 to make a profit. So you can be very competitive in the marketplace if you keep your overhead down. So really, in a way, if you're starting out, you have a greater chance of getting work than the person who's been doing it for 30 years because their expenses and their prices are too high for most jobs. So don't be intimidated by the number one photographer in town because just by being competitive, you can go out there and get work. I got more to talk about, but there you have it, folks. My favorite session of all. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.